From a studio high above the clouds of the Okanagan Valley, this is the Cannabis Podcast. Exploring the world of Canadian cannabis culture, one toke at a time. Now, here's your host and bud tender, Gary Johnston. Welcome back to the Cannabis Podcast, episode 103. If this is your first visit, an especially warm welcome for you. I hope you're here for the cannabis information which is ahead of you for the next 30 or 40 minutes or so. Welcome along for the ride. Before we get started, let me remind you, this program is intended only for those 19 or older in your jurisdiction and is intended purely for entertainment purposes. You should always consume your cannabis responsibly. This episode, we look at a new screening device that's coming to the Northwest Territories. How about 425 million grams of cannabis up in smoke, and I don't mean by consumers. A story from OkanaganZ.com on unlicensed cannabis becoming less prevalent and legal weed becoming more prevalent. On Cultivar Corner, we are going to sample some tea god organic green Dutchman cherry mints. And our feature interview this episode is with a friend of mine that I met at the BC Cannabis Summit. She works for Nine Point Agency and is the co-host of a podcast out of New Zealand called Bella's Who Blaze. In a few minutes, you're going to meet Kaya Blooms. All of that and more on episode 103 of the Cannabis Podcast. And once again, let me say thank you for being a listener. I really appreciate your support and the fact that you are here. Well, it happened, finally. After two and a half years of the pandemic, it took two social gatherings over the summer that were fairly close together. Apparently, that was my undoing. After a family reunion we had in July, that about 30 people. Then we had a staff party of about a dozen. A couple days after that staff party, I took my very first COVID test. And... It was positive. <laughs> I have to chuckle because I thought I was going to get through this. But lo and behold, I didn't. A really bad flu is how I would nail it down. Knocked me down for three days, I guess. And the, the worst thing for me, especially in the context of being here in the Cannabis Podcast, I lost my sense of smell and taste. So I didn't think I was going to be able to do a Cultivar Corner this episode. But luckily, it's slowly coming back, and, and I think we're ready to, to go for the cherry mints in, a, in just a little bit. But I wanted to update you on that, and, and that's kind of where I am. My energy is not quite back up to speed, so I hope you won't notice any of that. But, but there we go. That's the setup. That is what's brought us to this point. We finally hit COVID, and now it's kind of trickling around a whole bunch of different people, as I'm sure you're experiencing in your world, too. That's enough COVID talk. Let's get back to cannabis. We're going to head to the Northwest Territories. Well, actually, we're not. The story is about the Northwest Territories. I'm staying right here. This is a story from 420intel.com. Results in as little as 15 minutes. Officers with the Northwest Territories RCMP have a new tool to determine if drivers are over the legal limit for cannabis. The police service has now deployed the new roadside screening devices for THC across the territory. The Northwest Territory RCMP revealed that in a July 26 statement. Conducted similarly to roadside alcohol tests, the RCMP reports the devices are used to take an oral fluid sample and can be completed in about 15 minutes. The samples will show whether or not the driver in question is over the legal limit. The federal government notes that testing at or over 2 nanograms but under 5 nanograms of THC per milliliter of blood is a straight summary conviction offense, punishable by a maximum fine of $1,000. If a driver is convicted of a hybrid offense, either at or over 5 nanograms of THC per milliliter of blood, or at or over 2.5 nanograms of THC per milliliter of blood combined with 50 milligrams of alcohol per 100 milliliters of blood, carries mandatory minimum penalties of $1,000 fine for a first offense, 30 days imprisonment for a second offense, and 120 days imprisonment for a third offense. In the Northwest Territories, there is zero tolerance for alcohol and drugs for drivers 21 and under. Novice drivers and some commercial vehicle drivers, according to the Northwest Territories Liquor and Cannabis Commission. Screening in the Northwest Territories will not solely resolve around cars and trucks. 
It's a criminal offense to operate a motor vehicle, boat, snowmobile, all-terrain vehicle, or other motorized conveyance while under the influence of THC over the limit. Impaired operations of motor vehicles by alcohol and drugs remains an issue within the territory, the statement notes, adding that impaired driving is not only dangerous but entirely preventable. THC increases your chances of getting into a collision. This risk increases significantly when cannabis is combined with alcohol, the statement adds. In May of 2021, Newfoundland and Labrador's RCMP was set to start using portable roadside drug screening devices. The plan was to roll out 21 new devices which register as a pass or a fail for use in various areas throughout the province. Later that month, the RCMP announced that two men were arrested on May 22nd, which happened to be National Impaired Driving Enforcement Day. Four, drug-impaired driving after testing positive on the new screening equipment for active THC. The debate between THC detection and impairment has long raged. Professor Ian McGregor, academic director of the Lambert Initiative for Cannabinoid Therapeutics in Australia, supports adopting an evidence-based approach. Our legal frameworks probably need to catch up, McGregor argues, adding that prosecution solely on the basis of the presence of THC in blood or saliva is manifestly unjust. A U.S. study released in 2022 found that regular cannabis smokers taking part in simulated driving tests saw reduced skills behind the wheel, but indistinguishable performance at four and a half hours compared to those taking a placebo. Investigators in another study from 2021 did not see more driving impairment on occasional cannabis users compared to daily users. But it's also necessary to consider the influences that put a cannabis-consuming driver behind the wheel in the first place. A Canadian survey of youth views carried out last year found that driving under the influence of cannabis was normalized behavior and not believed to be as risky driving under the influence of alcohol. And there's an interesting perspective from 420intel.com, the Northwest Territories RCMP, 5 nanograms of THC per 100 milliliters of blood, and you are over the limit. From the cannabis-infused studio in the clouds, this is the Cannabis Podcast. And my thanks to David Wiley and the folks at theokanaganz.com for the next story, which says that more people are getting their supply from legal sources, according to a new B.C. government survey. Nearly 25,000 B.C. residents participated in the survey, which found a significant decrease in the number of weed consumers who reported buying from an unlicensed store, from 56% in 2018 to 17% in 2021. Just over 70% of consumers say they bought from licensed retailers. This comprehensive report gives us important information directly from people in British Columbia on their opinions and habits surrounding cannabis use, says Mike Farnworth, Minister of Public Safety and Solicitor General. From how it may impact their daily lives to perceptions around cannabis use and driving. It's important for us to know this information so we can support a strong cannabis sector in BC while continuing to keep public health and safety the cornerstone of our policies. The province's 2021 BC Cannabis Youth Survey follows up on an initial survey from 2018. It's one of the first large-scale provincial studies assessing changes in cannabis behaviors and perceptions, says the government. Results are representative of British Columbia's population and provide information specific to each health authority and health service delivery area. BC Stats has developed an online application that enables further exploration of the findings, and some of the highlights are, in 2021, 17% of people reported buying cannabis from a physical unlicensed store, down from 56% pre-legalization, and 9% bought from a dealer, down from 16% pre-legalization. There has been a decrease in self-reported driving after cannabis use since 2018. It went from 28% down to 15%. Since legalization, the prevalence of cannabis use in B.C. has increased 4 percentage points, from 28 to 32 percent. Ingestible methods of cannabis use, edibles, beverages, oils and tinctures, and vaping products have become more popular since legalization. Smoking dried flour has become less prevalent, although smoking is still the most popular method of use. And I guess that's where I'm an outlier. Dried Cannabis is still my preferred method of consumption. Interesting to see the market shifting and there to be, at least according to this survey, more people buying legal weed. I guess we got to keep at this and maybe we can continue to see success. I am happy to have a special guest on the Cannabis Podcast today. We met 
at the BC Cannabis Summit back in April. In fact, it was April 20th, 4.20 p.m. up on the rooftop. I'm not sure that's exactly when we met Kaya, but we met at the BC <laughs> Cannabis Summit. And I'd like to introduce you to Kaya Blooms, who is the co-host of another podcast, Bella's Who Blaze. Kaya, welcome to the Cannabis Podcast. Thank you so much for having me, Gary. It's a pleasure to finally be here after talking for so long to make this happen. Absolutely. It took a while for us to figure out the logistics of it. And, and what I wanted to know is where actually are you physically right now, Kaya? Where are you? I am physically in Vancouver, BC. Okay, I thought you were. And, and what confused mm-hmm. me is, uh, and, and you can answer this as we get further into it, because the Bellas Who Blaze is, is centered in New Zealand, is it not? Absolutely, it okay. is. It was a pandemic passion project, oh, shall lovely. we call it. Lovely. We'll hear that whole story first. But what I want to know is, what got you started in cannabis? Where did your journey begin? My journey really began when I was probably around 15, when I started to consume recreationally. I always found that alcohol wasn't quite working with my body. So my first foray into cannabis was then, but I didn't really understand the power of the plant shall we say, until I was really in my mid-20s figuring out all of the different um, aspects of cannabis that that you kind of go through in the journey of learning about plant medicine. So it was very much recreationally focused in my kind of teenage years. And then as I got into my 20s, I started to understand how it integrates into a balanced lifestyle and combined with the knowledge that I gained uh, learning about cannabis once moving to Vancouver. Nice. And it's fun sharing that knowledge, isn't it? Oh, uh, it's my favorite thing. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> I know. I've listened to a couple of episodes uh, of the Bellows Who Blaze to get myself oriented with what you do. Really enjoy what you're doing. And it, it is you and your sister that, that's on the show? It is. It is. My sister is the co-host and we kind of tag team episodes and some of them are with a guest who feature and share their knowledge and expertise. And then uh, my sister is great because she's also a longtime consumer, but not as, I guess, in depth in terms of the education or the nerdy side like I am. So um, she's very good at bringing up the questions or perspectives that a lot of people would have if they're not as... um, educated, I guess. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you two complement each other very nicely in, in the presentation of the podcast. No, oh, thank you very much. And thank you for listening. I appreciate it. Yeah, absolutely. So you had a, a love of cannabis. You, you discovered that as you were growing up recreationally. And, and then mm-hmm. you decided you wanted to do more. What, what made you start a podcast? What really was the catalyst of starting a podcast was one of the reasons I, I moved to Vancouver in 2018. Uh, to pursue this career in cannabis, knowing that Canada was going to legalize a recreational adult use market. And um, during the pandemic, I shifted and moved back home to New Zealand for a little bit. And it was right when New Zealand was having their election in 2020. And at the time of the election, there was also a referendum in place to vote to legalize cannabis or to not. And so I thought this is the perfect timing to go home. In my mind, I was like, they're going to legalize. There's no way it's not going to happen. And there was a, there was a large community that had the same thought come election day, come result day, we find out that we actually lost the vote to the no vote by a very slim margin around 1%, potentially less than. And that really was a reality check of where New Zealanders were at in terms of their perspective of cannabis, their understanding of cannabis and I just felt so emotionally uh, moved, shall we say, in the nicest way possible to do something about it because I was frustrated that no one was doing anything about it. And then I started to ask myself, well, actually, you're so passionate. What are you doing about it? And I realized, well, actually, (laughs) not a lot. So spurred by that, and my sister was on the same page as me, I was like, I want to do this podcast, but as I started to brainstorm these ideas of how to bring that to life, mainly because they're still a prohibition country, I didn't want to put my face out there on a YouTube or, you know, anything to really pretty much criminalize myself. Um, But I wanted to put a voice behind it. So I thought the podcast is a perfect medium. It's just my voice. And my sister was like, I will co-host with you whenever you need, because as I started out, it was very hard to start a podcast just yourself and a mic. It's very difficult to have a conversation just with yourself. Um, And that's how it kind of came about. And I wanted to share a different perspective of cannabis to New Zealanders to show 
the people, a community that I'd been a part of for two years when I moved to Vancouver, a community of really supportive women who were really out and proud about their cannabis consumption and really knowledgeable about it and also had very balanced perspectives of it because New Zealand isn't quite there yet. Um, slowly catching up for sure, but yeah, to show particularly women like myself who felt so alone in their cannabis journey that you're not alone, you're not abnormal, and this kind of world already exists and people are living it. So why not live it within your world too? Yeah, absolutely. So in New Zealand, do you do you have uh, a gray market like we had in Canada prior to legalization? Is, is that going absolutely. on Absolutely. Yeah? yeah, absolutely. There's a strong gray market and a lot of people doing some really exciting things. But okay. obviously... They can't really talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. So do you have the same situation where we had prior to legalization where there are stores where you can go and you can you can buy your weed, but it isn't considered legal? That's still part of no, it? No, okay. it's it's much, much more conservative. It's really like pre, pre that. It's, you know, I, I meet a lot of people who struggle to even find a source of cannabis and people message me asking me where can they source it. And I really also don't have an answer for them unfortunately it's really like um you might know someone in your community but it's just within a community so um there aren't stores that you can just walk into and even you're also pretty conscious of where you consume cannabis in the public as well um it's not something that you can just go to a park and consume it some people do but um there's definitely still a risk in doing that yeah run the risk of arrest and, and imprisonment perhaps Absolutely, especially depending on your skin color as well. Yeah, That's a reality. I mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I absolutely bet. So, so what's been one of your toughest challenges in, in getting the Bellas Who Blaze going and, and keeping it going with you and your sister on other sides of the world? I think that's the current challenge we're navigating. Um, <laughs> it was really helpful when I was back home um, in New Zealand because my sister and I are in the same country. And uh, during the pandemic, um, her job in particular was a little bit more on and off because she works in film. So she was able to match my schedule a bit more. But now that we're both on different schedules, different time zones, it's getting much more, uh, much more difficult to coordinate that. And um, I think the biggest challenge is for me, I had after season one, I had this idea of what season two was going to look like and feel like and sound like. But then I une unexpectedly but expectedly moved back to Vancouver as well and then re-immersed myself into the industry again after almost a year and a half, meeting people like yourself at the BC Cannabis Summit, at Lyft & Co Toronto, um, grow up in Victoria. And these ideas that I had, I was like, actually, I kind of need to absorb everything again and um, recalibrate my myself within the industry, but also just my understanding and what kind of stories I want to share. So I ended up going back to the drawing board because I'm the type of person that likes to, it's, it might be weird to say, but I see a season for my podcast in particular, almost like an artist creating an album. And it's like, I want the story to flow from start to finish and so thinking about that for season two, I'm still figuring out what that beginning and end of that series of stories are. So okay, interesting. I think that's been my biggest challenge. Yeah, yeah absolutely. <laughs> and, and what's been the most exciting part that, that, that you have encountered so far, be it, a, be it a guest you might have had on or a particular story you covered? What's kind of really got you fired up so far? I think for me, absolutely. The guests that I've had a privilege to have on my podcast, the people that really just make the time to interview and chat with me and share their stories, because it is for a lot of people, a vulnerable area of their life. There's been some kind of catalyst that brought them to cannabis and for them to open up about, you know, whether it might be a life changing accident or an incident. I just really have so much gratitude for people that are able to share that with my audience. Um, obviously, Dr. Dina being such an instrumental um, advocate in the US, she was amazing to speak to. Chloe Swabrook is a politician in New Zealand in the Green Party. Um, the fact that she made the time to provide her perspective, those things really showed me like, wow, I might have something here. And then I think what really keeps me going is the feedback that I get from my listeners. You know, and 
I we put a surprise holiday episode up at the end of last year and immediately as the podcast went out and the post went up on Instagram, I got these messages like, oh my gosh, I saw this surprise episode come up and I was like, it listened to it immediately and just that excitement, but also appreciation that we got from the conversations that we're having and um, just knowing that there are people out there that are telling me like, I finally feel seen because I'm always uh, judged for my consumption or those things make just really fill my heart. Yeah. And it's the same with me. I feel the same way when I get feedback from, from listeners who, who comment on, on, on the appreciation of what you're doing and, and the mm-hmm. fact that you're putting out the information, taking the time to get it out there. So you're in season two now? Is that what you said? Yes. So okay. season two is kind of planning. And I do that because I want it to be a source of education. Yeah. And given my audience is mainly um, in New Zealand, their, I guess, understanding and knowledge of cannabis might not be as far as a market like Canada. Yeah. And so with that in mind, I kind of map out, okay, what kind of educational journey makes sense for someone that doesn't know anything or is just curious and wants to find out? So yeah, yeah, just covering basic things like flower, what the plant is, the fact that it's female, those things, like bringing people on that journey that I kind of went through um, myself. Yeah. I got a chance to experience, we had a staff party uh, in my backyard on Sunday night. And there oh, were fun. a number of my staff who had never seen a live growing cannabis plant before. So I wow. gave them my jeweler's loop and let them go in to, to take a look at my autoflowers and they were just blown away. Yeah. <laughs> They'd never experienced those. So that enthusiasm for the people who haven't experienced something in cannabis is what keeps us both going, I think. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, excellent. In relation to where you're going and, and what you're doing, the various events you have gone to over the last year, Kaya, mm-hmm. as I say, you were at the BC Cannabis Summit. You invited mm-hmm. me to come to the Grow the Grow mm-hmm. Seminar in Victoria. Yeah. Unfortunately, I couldn't make it. You were at Lift Co. in Toronto as well. So yes. what kind of activity are you doing there that's helping the industry that, that I'm sure has some sidebar effects on your podcast? Yeah, Um I guess that my main role with Nine Point Agency is really helping brands manage and build their reputation. So that could be through events. It could be through media relations. So getting people to talk about a particular brand or a story or a, or a product or person. Um, and how I see that contributing overall to the industry is we're really shaping what cannabis looks, feels, and sounds like. And we've had this stigma for so long of what it looks like, feels like, sounds like, the stereotype, the stigma, the kind of reefer madness type appearance. And I really see myself as a communications professional to firstly break down those complicated uh, topics like concentrates, um, vape cartridges, you know, things like that that are really complex for even a cannabis consumer. They're like, I don't understand the difference between distillate or full spectrum extract or whatever it may be. So breaking down those complex topics into something digestible that a consumer can really understand and grasp and then enjoy. But also for those, for the market that are still skeptical or scared of cannabis to kind of create a a nice steady incline ramp for them to just start to explore cannabis. Nothing that's going to scare them, nothing that's going to put them off, but slowly start to introduce and really welcome them into this world of cannabis. Yeah, I I really like that phrase, that (laughs) incline of experience that so expresses what we want people to do. Exactly. The slow, steady, you know, a little bit more educated and um, so that you don't have those, you know, horrid brownie experiences that most consumers have once in their life. (laughs) That everyone has had. Yeah, exactly. So Kaya and I were both on one of the panels at the BC Cannabis Summit, and that was on stigma in the digital communications age. Mm -hmm. What did you think about the the panel and, and everything that we heard in that session? I think it's interesting because there were so many different perspectives of stigma. There was obviously the censorship of cannabis on platforms like Instagram and, um, and how to go around that despite having a legal market in Canada. I also think it's interesting to explore the stigma of media in general, right? The number of podcasts that really talk about cannabis, fairly slim. The number of lifestyle media publications, uh, journalists that are willing to touch cannabis in a lifestyle perspective is still very small as well. We maybe have a handful of journalists who are 
cannabis specialists and experts who write about it. But when you cross over into where we want to see cannabis, which is in, you know, the magazines like Fashion or like a Woman's Day or an L Mag, um, we just don't see that crossover happening because there's still that stigma and also the lack of education. So I think exploring all of those arenas and then also how PR kind of fits as public relations as a discipline fits into that was really interesting to chat with everyone about. Yeah, I bet. Yeah, it, it's fascinating the work that you're doing. I, I, I like that there are people like you in the industry that are that are keeping that engagement going because because we have to keep talking about it or, or it's it's not going to get any better. Like yourself. Where do you think we need to go, Kaya? What, what do you think needs to happen. Let's look at the Canadian market. Mm -hmm. Let's talk, talk about edibles. What do you think needs to happen in the Canadian market to address the current concerns that are out there in, in the legal world regarding edibles? The idea from my perspective is clearly everybody who comes into my store, mm -hmm. or at least 90% of the people who come into my store say, I want an edible uh, and I want 50 milligrams. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm sorry, I can sell you five packages, but, but you're probably not going to buy those. Yeah. From your experience and the listeners that you have on your show, that's important to be addressed? Absolutely. I think because from a consumer perspective, for some consumers, five milligram, a five milligram gummy might be just right for them and that's all they need. But if you're dealing with someone who um, is has chronic back pain or migraines or some other health issue, but they're still using it as a lifestyle tool or a wellness management tool, and they can still only get five or 10 milligrams per unit, but they really need a hundred. I think um, that's not really fair on them. And the understanding of cannabis as a wellness tool, but also as a medicine, I think needs to improve from a, from a government perspective. Um, and there's just- Yeah, we need, we need to be able to comfortably talk about what we all talk about when we're not on the store floor. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> and to and I think I noticed this in New Zealand too, but just this fear of THC, you know, everyone's really on board globally with CBD. I mean, Japan is a highly prohibition country when it comes to cannabis. You could be put in jail just for being, you know, suspected of consuming cannabis. Like they could find a roach and they would pin it on you and say, you're going to jail but there are CBD stores everywhere and everyone's raving about CBD. And I'm thinking, do you not know they're from the same plant? <laughs> it's just one component versus the other. So yeah, yeah just this. It's insane. Mm, I think the fear of THC gets a bad rep because, because it is the psychoactive compound. It, it could have other, you know, side effects, but yep. we need to kind of move, move past that fear and really think about the, benefit to the consumer because we've got to this incredible point of legalization why not open it up a little bit more from there yeah we don't want to lose the ground that, that we've gained and, and continue our forward movement mm. excellent and i and i had another i had another question i was going to ask and i'm having a cannabis moment <laughs> uh, where it's done uh, we all have suddenly gone out of my head <laughs> give me a moment it'll come back to me um it was related to what we were talking about before and related to the stigma maybe legislation all oh, right Okay, it came back. See, that's that's what I there love. There you go. It, it, it makes that circle. Yeah, it does. <laughs> BC. Yeah. We have some laws, some new regulations. Uh, first one, July 8th, uh, with the ability to, so the July, f the August 15th is the ability to deliver through third parties. Mm -hmm. What do you think about that? I think that's exciting because now we're finally, the legal market is finally competing with the legacy market. Yeah. You know, the yeah, legacy I, market through the pandemic, I was getting cannabis delivered to my door. I didn't, I didn't want to go into a store. I didn't want to have to deal with all of that curbside. Um, and to know that uh, legal retailers can now kind of compete on that level as well is yeah. amazing. And I heard, I think it was maybe Corey Waldron or someone from Moods Cannabis uh, mm -hmm. in one of the panel discussions talk about, you know, just the the higher purchasing or cart value of online versus in store. So for retailers Absolutely. too, right? It's just such yep. a great um, addition to your business when you're already really struggling out there. Totally. Basket size is almost double mm. online from what an individual get in the store. So that's absolutely something to, to consider. Mm. What other things from your perspective do you think we need to be addressing or, or 
considering some change in the cannabis industry? Pick one or two that that you think are valid points that we need to really address. I think for me, it's really consumption spaces. Lovely. You know, yes. I'm I'm the type of person that wants to have a really fun time with their friends, wants to do something social and go out, but not necessarily be in a bar environment. But then when I think about, okay, where can I go to really consume cannabis and enjoy time with my friends? There actually aren't a lot of places you can go aside from potentially your home, if you can even consume in your home. If you're renting and you can't consume, you can't even be in your home. So True safe enough. spaces True that you know don't necessarily serve alcohol but might serve food and beverages plus you can consume your cannabis those spaces to me would really help build the community to potentially help to break down that barrier of fear that certain consumers have um, and just serves as a space for education as well yeah, absolutely. I totally agree. Had an opportunity to do the consumption lounges at the BC Cannabis Summit. That to me was a perfect example of how it can mm-hmm. work. Absolutely. Do you do your episodes weekly on the podcast? No, they're kind of semi-weekly. So I'm still in the okay. process of season two at the moment. Season okay. three is a little bit right. further down the line. And what do you, uh, are you going to finish up with in season two? What do you, What's coming up that you're looking forward to? I think I'm really looking forward to some of the guests that I'll have on the podcast. I don't really want to disclose mm-hmm. that too soon, but I totally get yeah. that. That's understandable. Yeah. And then I guess also how it's going to take shape with my sister and I as well, because we have a certain rhythm to our conversation and flow. So hoping that that all kind of meshes together for season two. Do you do your interviews together or you do them separately? I do them separately. So I tend to do Uh, guest interviews and then my sister and I do our um, co-hosted show as well. So, Because I was just thinking the logistics of the two of you doing the interview from across the world is probably a little it's, difficult. Yeah, it's, that's a little much. <laughs> <laughs> and what are your plans uh, personally for, for the cannabis world? What do you hope that you're going to be able to accomplish as, as we finish out this year? Yeah, I'm, I hope to continue my um, advocacy and the great work we do at Nine Point Agency, helping brands to really launch into market successfully, build community bases, um, really pro- profile their products as well and uh, connect with their customers. I'm really excited to see where the Association of Canadian Cannabis Retailers is going to go. Um, being on the advisory board, it's been amazing to see, you know, everything that the um, organization has achieved from pulling off the summit, heading into planning the next one. I'm also working on expanding my knowledge in the concentrates area. Extracts and concentrates is probably my preferred format of cannabis. So Okay. Um, I'm doing the Trichome Institute Interpena courses at the I've moment. Done that one. Yeah, how yep. did you find that? that? That's a great course. I really enjoyed yeah. it. Yeah, yeah. I did that uh, probably just after it came out, uh, and I've done one update the, that they did. Yeah. Too. Um, it, it really taught you to, you know, it's all in the nose, and and that totally. sativa indica hybrid breakdown yep. is really quite fascinating. The the disappointing fact is. In most stores, we can't smell the cannabis. I know. <laughs> Very few stores, maybe like Burb and um, there's a few that I went into recently where you can. But, I mean, it's also you don't know how long that jar's been there for. So <laughs> Exactly. Exactly. You don't. Yeah. Yeah. So that's cool. So carry on some more education for you? Yeah, absolutely. I'm always, I think a lot of people say this in the industry, but we're all students of the plant. So continuing to expand that knowledge and learning and um, – Yeah, just building on the knowledge that I gained from doing the cannabis sommelier certificates, which I've done both of through CannaReps, getting a different perspective from Trichome Institute with Max Montrose. um, And yeah, he's a he's a true weed guy. (laughs) Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So yeah, really absorbing from some of the best people in the industry. Yeah, I've taken all of their courses, and they and they were all pretty Mm -hmm. good. So so I quite enjoyed that. Yeah. So if people want to listen to Bellas Who Blaze, Mm -hmm. how do they go about that? Yeah, so you can find Bellas Who Blaze on all the main podcast platforms. That's Apple Podcasts. um, There's Spotify. We're also on Red Circle. And uh, I think the main places you could go is uh, the Bellas Who Blaze Instagram, which is at Bellas Who Blaze. And then all the links are in the link in bio to direct you to wherever you want to listen to the podcast. 
Well, it's been lovely. We finally got together and, and had some conversation, Kaya. I just want to thank you for taking some time to speak with me today. Yeah, thank you so much for having me, Gary. And congratulations on your long running podcast. I mean, more yeah. than 100 episodes. Yeah. That's incredible for someone that's put out 12. So. <laughs> Yeah, there you go. And now I'm going to finish up with my hot seat questions. So just uh, four or five short questions, just looking for your response. Your favorite cultivar? Oh, you've thrown that at me. Okay, so <laughs> I think my all-time favorite cultivar might be, that's really hard to choose like a favorite, but if I had to pick one, I absolutely love Green Crack. Okay. That is like my ultimate um, I wouldn't say ultimate, but I love just the energetic, social sort of effects of that cultivar and okay. also just how lime green and just fresh it is as well. <laughs> it's just beautiful. Yeah. I love the different components that we all find fascinating about our favorite yeah. weeds. So, so I love that. Color definitely plays a, plays a part. Yeah. Edibles or flower? I think I'd go flower. Mm -hmm. Okay. A uh, vape or a joint? I would choose, if we're going for a full spectrum, if we're going for a high terpene, full spectrum extract, I would choose mm -hmm. a vape. But if it's okay. distillate, I would choose a uh, joint. So you prefer the distillate infused in the joint? Mm, I mean, that's okay too. I prefer like a hash infused into a joint. Versus oh, okay. distillate. Yeah. I tend to agree yeah. with you. <laughs> and, and now this question will be interesting because you are from New Zealand, but you spent a good deal of time in Canada. And it's a question I have asked guests right across our country. And the reason I find it fascinating is three and a half grams is known by different names across our country. Mm -hmm. In BC, we call it an eighth traditionally. Yes. Do you have a name that you have typically applied for three and a half grams? That's, uh, in New Zealand, it's known as a 50 or a 50. There you go. See, we, we've got a new yeah. one. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I guess like a gram here is yeah. known as a tinny. A, a tinny. tinny. <laughs> Very cool. Because it's usually a small I, I amount. I love learning new language. Yeah, it's usually a small yeah. amount wrapped in tinfoil. <laughs> See, I wouldn't have pictured that one yeah. either. Oh, that's fabulous, yeah. Karen. Thank you so much. <laughs> well, I appreciate you taking some time to be a guest on the Cannabis Podcast, and I hope you enjoy the rest of your night. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me, and it was so lovely to chat with you and appreciate you having me on your podcast. THC, CBD, terpene profiles, what's in me? Oh, please explain to me. Go to the corner. Go to the corner. Oh, yeah. On Cultivar Corner today, we're going back to the folks from the Green Organic Dutchman. And what we're tasting today is their organic cherry mints. Really like their green glass jars. They have that funky little adaptation where they kind of lean and it's easy to pull your buds out of the jar. And speaking of pulling buds out of the jar... <laughs> Look at that guy. My goodness, that was almost, I think it was about two and a half grams, that particular bud. Really nice looking flower, really smells nice now. Speaking of smelling nice, <laughs> I was worried for a bit that there was not going to be a cultivar corner this episode. Because as you may have heard, I did get COVID over the last couple of weeks. Lost my sense of taste and smell. And I was worried that when it came to doing a cultivar corner, I wasn't going to be able to taste the cannabis or smell the cannabis. I'm pleased to say it's coming back. It's not full bore, but it is coming back. Enough that I can tell you this is really sweet smelling weed. This organic cherry mints from Tea God. Let's give you the details on it. Organic cherry mints, a high THC sativa hybrid with genetics originating from seed junkie. It's a sticky, dense floral bud that brings with it smooth berry flavor and aroma with just a hint of menthol undertone. Well, perhaps I'm not back to full fruition to pick up those menthol undertones. Definitely getting that floral bud, that smooth berry flavor, and, and this bud is really sticky. Now, 
that bud is too big for it to show much stick. But as soon as you break one of those pieces off and you stick it on your finger and you can see that there's a significant amount of stick to that. It's nice to get some sticky weed once in a while. So organic cherry mince is grown in living soil. It grows tall and bushy, and it's supplemented with natural sources of carbohydrates like molasses and maple syrup that bring its sweet scent to life. And we discovered that when we did sugar bush. Organic cherry mince is an excellent daytime strain for those who are looking for a high THC sativa without lethargic effects. And here we are. This is a Saturday, my first Saturday off for a while, and my first exposure to some cannabis on this Saturday. So what a perfect opportunity to give a sample for Cultivar Corner. The genetic parents, Cherry AK-47 and Cush Mints number 11. And the dominant terpenes in this, organic cherry mints, uh, 2.5 to 4.5% total terps. And there will be beta-myrcene, transcaryophylline, alpha-pinene, and farnesine. Farnesine often is the one we hear when we talk about fruity flavors. But here again, I feel like a little ripped off. <laughs> they said total terpenes ranging between 2.5 and 4.5. I just got 2.1. <laughs> I know that's that's not a terrible difference, but it's, it's 0.4 difference. <laughs> I feel somewhat ripped off. And my terpenes are myrcene, transcaryophylline, and alpha-pinene. Beta-myrcene, transcaryophylline, and alpha-pinene which is pretty well what they said before, not listing for me any farnesine. I think with that kind of a lead-in, this time we had a smoke of this. I've got the Crafty Plus all ready to go. Made sure that was ready this time. I've got my joint of the Tea God Organic Cherry Mint, and let's have a taste. Now, the other relevant piece that I have not given you yet is what the THC on this is sitting at, and that is at 23.7%. 23.7, that seems a pretty decent THC. Should give me a pretty good hit. Mmm. Smooth. Some of that berry taste in the smoke. When they say a hint of menthol, I'm, I'm kind of thinking back to menthol cigarettes. That's kind of what I'm expecting to, to feel, but I'm not feeling any of that. As I say, very smooth. Really like the smoothness of that. And now I want to see what it tastes like. So we've got the Crafty Plus. It's all ready to rock. Let's do Gary's traditional two-fisted toking. And here we go with the Crafty Plus. Oh, wow. Once again, even as I come off of COVID with having a lack of taste and smell, slowly coming back for me. As soon as I put on the Crafty Plus, those fruity notes, oh, that floral scents, mm, just comes a flying off of that. Now, interestingly enough, it's also creating a bit of a tickle at the back of my throat when I come using the vaporizer as opposed to the joint. Which I find a bit odd. It's usually the other way around. Oh, and there they are. <laughs> As I mentioned before, this is a Saturday when I am recording this Cultivar Corner. Looking for some fun stuff. Going to be putting the rest of the episode together as the day progresses. Get ready to publish tomorrow, I believe. And on a day like that, when I've had three or four hits and I can feel those happy eyes coming on, <laughs> this is going to be a fun day. Oh, it is coming on gangbusters now. 23.7% THC. And I think it's that magic threesome for me in terms of the terpenes. Myrcene, caryophylline, pinene, more specifically beta-myrcene, transcaryophylline, alpha-pinene, and throw a little farnesine in that mix. And that generally produces a pretty darn good high for me. A sativa high, and I know we're trying to get away from these discussions of sativa and indica, I really wish we could, but it's going to take some time. We are so ingrained, and, and even in the store, people are still so ingrained in that whole sativa indica spectrum kind of thing. I really wish we could speak more about the terpenes and just the effect 
that those terpenes are going to have. For example, in this one, uh, this is the sativa. I'm looking for some focus. I'm looking for some energy. I'm I'm looking for some creativity. And, and all of that is wrapped up in my little two-fisted toques here. And you may detect that I could be speaking a bit faster <laughs> and perhaps rambling a bit more because that high is coming on. Oh, got to warm up the Crafty Plus one more time. I'll let that expire, but I still got the joint going. And if you've heard me discuss lately about this concept of, you know, smoking a little weed and getting that effect, and then if you smoke more of it, it either degrades that effect or makes it better. And I guess that's an area where, frankly, as a daily consumer, I probably fall down a little bit. I probably smoke more of the weed than I really need to in most cases. Like, in, and here we are. You know, I've almost finished the Crafty Plus. I still got half of the joint. I'm pretty high. I should just put them down and say, that's it. That's Cultivar Corner. But but will I? <laughs> well, I think I will try just simply because I have to start doing that. Oh, thankfully, the Crafty Plus warmed up in time for me to get a couple more hits of that beautiful taste. So again, we've got those smooth berry flavor and aroma with a hint of menthol undertone. I'm not getting any menthol undertone. But I'm definitely getting some of that berry flavor and the aroma, especially from the Crafty Plus. Not so much from the joint, but from the, the joint, a really smooth smoke. 23.7% THC, beta myrcene, transcaryophylline, alpha pinene, and farnesine are predominant terpenes. And high are predominant effect. <laughs> I'm liking this. This is going to be a fun Saturday, a little sativa driven from T God's. Organic Cherry Mints. And we're going to finish today with a story from mjbizdaily.com. This is another story by Matt Lamers about 425 million grams of cannabis being destroyed. Canadian licensed producers have destroyed a growing amount of cannabis every year since adult use legalization nearly four years ago. The latest data signals that some of Canada's mass producers might need to further rein in output to bring it more in line with forecasted sales, after years of trying to right-size capacity so they're not growing more than they're able to sell. All told, Canada's federally licensed marijuana producers destroyed a record 425 million grams, or 468 tons, of unsold, unpackaged dried cannabis last year. Last year's total was up more than 50% from the 279 million grams of dried cannabis destroyed in 2020. LPs destroyed 155 million grams in 2019. Seattle-based analytics firm Headset estimates that sales of dried cannabis and pre-rolls amounted to 293 million grams last year in four key provinces, indicating destroyed inventory again exceeded sold production. Headset monitor sales in Alberta, British Columbia, Ontario, and Saskatchewan, which together account for approximately three-quarters of all legal sales of recreational marijuana products in Canada. In addition to the destruction of unpackaged dried cannabis, more than 7 million packaged cannabis products across the country were sent for destruction in 2021. Quantities of destroyed cannabis include 3.5 million packages of dried cannabis, 1.1 million packages of extracts, including vapes, 2.4 million packages of edibles, including beverages, and almost 16,000 packages of topicals. Destruction has been growing in Canada's young cannabis industry after the largest producers funded and built out more production capacity than the industry needed. Most of the biggest greenhouse transactions led to direct real estate losses worth millions of dollars and balance seat adjustments worth billions of dollars in inventory and other asset write-downs. Since 2018, almost 900 million grams of unpackaged dried cannabis has been destroyed by licensed producers because of overproduction and quality issues, a weight approximately equal to 650 Toyota Prius cars. That figure would easily pass the 1 billion gram mark when destroyed packaged marijuana is accounted for. Stuart Maxwell, a cannabis crop consultant based in British Columbia, said some large producers might be putting off destruction to make their balance sheets look better than they really are. I think some of the larger producers just want cannabis in their inventories. 
Even if they never sell it, it still looks good on your books to have assets, he said. A lot of producers aren't destroying products when it's ready to be destroyed, even though it's no longer marketable. Across all product categories in Canada, the amount of packaged products sitting in corporate inventories far exceeds the amount of packaged merchandise that is sold. The imbalance primarily lies with licensed producers, not wholesalers or retailers, Health Canada data suggests. Maxwell warned that the overproduction will make life difficult for most new entrants into the industry. I'm a crop consultant. I make my living teaching people how to grow more weed. But quite often my first meeting is uncomfortable, he said. A majority of the time I'm telling people, I'm sorry, but you're going to fail. And they usually don't hire me when I tell them that, but that's the reality if you're just getting into this industry now. The odds are, even if you are a good actor and you have substantial financial assets behind you, the numbers are not good for anyone. Because of these issues, oversupply, cannabis can't find its real price point. Another interesting perspective from mjbizdaily.com. It's astounding to me that we can build an industry or try to build an industry that almost has some some inbred failures. That, Well, I guess they say that you have to make mistakes before you can learn, right? Well, we're getting pretty darn good at making those mistakes. We should have learned our lesson by now. Let me once more thank you for being a listener. I really appreciate that you are here, and however you support me just as a listener, as a subscriber, or maybe you want to buy me a doobie. If you feel so inclined, you can do that at buymeacoffee.com slash Cannabis Podcast. And if you ever have a comment on anything you hear on the Cannabis Podcast, please send a note to info at CannabisPodcast.com. There are some exciting things coming up. I have some interviews lined up. I have some new weed being sent to me. This could be a fun summer and fall. That wraps it up for episode 103 of the Cannabis Podcast. From the cannabis-infused studio, high above the Okanagan Valley, this was the Cannabis Podcast. Podcast.